All right, what's up, Bulldogs? Today we are gonna be talking about an interesting subject. We're gonna go into the philosophical, so if you like these kind of discussions, great. If you don't, you're probably not gonna like this video because we're gonna go pretty deep here because we're gonna be discussing why only programmers, only people who understand software development, who understand programming computers, can really understand the universe, okay? And the reason for this is because, I'm gonna explain the real reason for it, like the, why this actually makes sense, but it is because we are living in a simulation. All right, now I know you might not believe we're living in a simulation, that's fine. I do believe that we are living in a simulation. I do believe that there's enough evidence that points to this. And when you have a programmer mindset, okay, and you understand how all of these paradoxes in the world that don't make any sense sort of make sense when you think of it as a simulation, I think you'll be more convinced of it, all right? If you already are, you know, I'll, I'll give you some arguments that will make sense. If you don't know anything about software development or programming or anything, it's fine. I'll still explain it at a level that I think you can understand. And then you can look into this. And this is also a good reason why everyone should learn software development. You don't have to necessarily become a programmer as your career, but you should learn some software development so that you can understand some of these things. And it also does change the way that you think and about life and, and, and view life. Uh, I also think you should learn to play poker so you can understand probability and statistics a little bit better because that also influences a lot of your life. But uh, but yeah, th those are kind of two, two really major life shifting or mindset shifting types of skills that you can develop, all right, that I think are, are pretty valuable. So uh, let's, let's start with, I suppose, the paradox, okay, what, what got me onto this? So I was watching this video and it was talking about Zeno's paradox. And if you're not familiar with Zeno's paradox, it's basically, there's a few different paradoxes that are, that are similar, but basically the paradox says that you can't go anywhere. You can't get anywhere. And the reason why is because in order to go from point A to point B, you have to travel half of the distance, okay? Well, in order to travel half of the distance, you have to be able to travel half of that distance and half of that distance and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you, you could never go anywhere because you can infinitesimally divide a distance in half, all right? Um, there's also a, a different version of it that involves time, where it, which says that an arrow can never move or nothing can move because if you slice any moment in time uh, and look at it, it's not moving. <laughs> Therefore, it, how does it move? If it's never moving and you, you, you look at it at any moment in time, you can stop time. If you could stop time, it would not be moving, all right? So there, there's you know various ways that people have sort of said, well, this, there's some incorrect assumptions here and, and whatnot, but I mean, logically it does make sense, these, these paradoxes. You have to kind of do some mental gymnastics to get around some of these ideas. However, there is one solution that does make a whole lot of sense. And if you're a programmer, especially if you're a game programmer, which means that you're a simulation programmer because all games are simulations, or if you understand game programming, then you will understand this perfectly and I will explain it to you, okay? So the way that this works is that, let's say that you have a Pac-Man game, okay? And let's say that you wanna move Pac-Man, okay? So Pac-Man is someplace on the screen. He's rendered on the screen, right? The, the program, what it's gonna do is it's gonna see where all of the objects on the screen should be and it will draw them, okay? Then there will be a tick, a simulation of time. So within a game or within a simulation, time is simulated, okay? And it's called a tick, right? Or an iteration of the game loop, okay? And so basically the game is running in this loop, okay? And every tick of this loop, every iteration of this loop, it checks things. It checks to see if there's some input from the controller. So if you pushed, uh, let's say left on the controller, okay? Then what would happen is it would register that and say, oh, the, the left, uh, of the controller is being pushed right now. So what action shall I take? Well, in this case, it would tell Pac-Man that he's now going to have a different velocity, okay? He's gonna have a uh, velocity and a vector. So that just means uh, direction. So he's basically going to be now have a velocity of some intensity of some speed, we'll say, in the left direction, okay? If he didn't have that before. Okay, now what happens is it gets to Pac-Man and it says, okay, well, what should Pac-Man do? Well, the game is gonna calculate, it's gonna say, okay, I'm gonna look at the delta of time that's passed. When was the last time I checked on Pac-Man? Should have been one tick ago, which whatever the 
uh, the delta in the system is or whatever the, the smallest unit of time, right? So the, the game would have a smallest unit of time. Let's say it's one second. So let's say that the game updates every second, okay? What's gonna happen then is it's gonna say, okay, well, what was the velocity in the vector of this object, of this Pac-Man object? And so now it's gonna say, okay, well, his vector is left, okay? And the velocity is whatever, you know, the, the speed was of, of the movement, okay? And then it's gonna move his position by calculating how much should he have moved in that interval of time, okay? And then it's gonna now place its coordinates over to the left somewhere, okay? And then when it's time to draw the screen, it's going to calculate his new position, which is already calculated, it's gonna draw him in that new position and erase him from the other position, okay? So you're gonna see him move, all right? And when this happens over and over, rapidly, it appears to be movement. What's really happening is that simply the locations and the inputs are being calculated in some interval of time and they're being updated based on that. So it's a simulation. So there's no true movement. There's no true passage of time. It is literally simulating all of these things. Now, the reason why this makes so much sense and the reason why this solves let's say Zeno's paradox and why it makes sense that we would be in a simulation is because the problem with uh, with Zeno's paradox is that it, you know, or, or the problem with the universe, what people think about the universe, and the reason why that even is a paradox at all, is that people think that the universe has a infinite amount of time, meaning that you could, let's say that we measure things, right? You can take, uh, you know, an hour, okay? But you could break that down into minutes, and you could break that down into seconds, and you could break down seconds into nanoseconds, and so on and so forth. And they think that you could continually break this down uh, into smaller and smaller time units, okay? The same thing with distance, right? Just like we said with Zeno's Paradox, is it true that, you know, you can take a distance and you can break it down and you can just keep on going half and half of that distance? No, it's actually not true, because it's not true in the game world, right? In a game, there's something called a resolution, okay? And what that means is that is the lowest level of resolution for, for something, right? So for example, time has a resolution, right? So whatever that game world is, maybe it's like every 10 nanoseconds is when that game updates, okay? But that's the lowest level of resolution. There, You cannot have something that is five nanoseconds if that clock counter in that game only registers things on a 10 second loop or a 10 nanosecond loop, if that makes sense, okay? So in that, in that sense, that 10 nanoseconds is an indivisible unit of time. Okay, there is nothing smaller than that. It is either that or it's the previous or it's the next. There is no nowhere else, okay? The same thing applies to distance. So in computer terms, it's pixels, right? It's pixels on the screen, at least when we render it and we display it for all intents and purposes, that's a simple enough explanation. So that means that you can't have something that's half a pixel, okay? <laughs> right, it doesn't make sense. How would you draw that on the screen? You can't. Right, so things have to be uh, a certain distance. There's a certain resolution or a certain smallest unit of, that is indivisible of distance, okay? And so there's a lot of explanations that make sense, okay, in this universe, in this world, when you really think about things as a simulation because now, oh, okay, if time has a smallest unit, we don't know what that smallest unit is, whatever the smallest unit that, it would essentially be the smallest unit that was would be possible to measure, okay, but there is a smallest unit, then that makes sense, that solves that problem because there is a point where you get to a, a, a constant that nothing can be uh, lesser uh, of a smaller unit of time than this. The same thing for distance, okay, there's a smallest unit of distance, and then um, for for many other attributes of the world, right? So for example, subatomic particles, right? You know, you say, okay, well, you have molecule, you have things that are composed of molecules and those molecules are composed of atoms, okay? And then you could break up those atoms, you could have protons and neutrons and electrons, and you could break those up and you could have quarks and you could break those up and you could have small nuclear particles or whatever, um, you know, uh, the, the God particle, the helicon or whatever it is, right? So, but what, what what this would say and what makes sense is that you can't infinitesimally break things up. There is some smallest unit. We might not know what it is right now because you know this simulation that we're running at is a pretty high resolution uh, simulation, but there is some unit 
that is the smallest that it could possibly be, and there's nothing smaller than that, okay? And that solves a lot of problems. It makes a lot of sense. In fact, if you really reason this out and if you really think about this, it is the only way <laughs> that that is possible, okay? Again, this is evidence of why we're in a simulation. Yeah, you can argue against this, but if you think about it, let's just take subatomic particles, right? Can you infinitesimally divide them? Does that even make sense, right? Does that even make sense? If you think about that, doesn't that ultimately create an unsolvable paradox if you believe, if you start with the axiom that everything can be broken down you know, into half, let's say, or to smaller parts? That creates a real serious problem because how is that possible? To infinity, right? Is there really an infinite amount of smaller parts uh, that are within uh, a particle? It doesn't make sense, right? So the only thing that does make sense is that you're in a simulation, that there is not an infinite number of smaller parts, that you, you must have some limit to that. And what would make sense is that it is some kind of a simulation. Now, this, some of the, the science behind this, uh, I, I think you'll, you'll find really interesting if, you, if you're interested in this so far. And uh, there's some sources for this. There's uh, actually some books that you can read that will give you uh, the, the, a lot of this information, right? That, that we'll, we'll talk about this stuff. Okay, I actually had the guy, the author that wrote uh, some of these books, Tom Campbell, on my YouTube channel here uh, a while back. Okay, I did an interview with him when I was first reading the books, but I forgot about these books for a while. And recently, you know, through a lot of <laughs> coincidences that have been happening in my life, which are not coincidences, I call them synchronicities, uh, I have been reintroduced to those. And, uh, and this topic came up as well and organically, and it just kind of fits together. So uh, if you're really interested in this topic, read My Big Toe. It's My Big Theory of Everything, okay? And this is a book series that is written by a physicist who... Uh, had some out-of-body experiences, okay, that he learned how to control. Again, it seems a little crazy and weird up here, but if you listen to what he's saying and how he explains the science uh, of kind of what I just described to you, but obviously he's got much more detailed explanations of all of these things, uh, it makes a lot of sense. It makes, a, it, it explains just about every phenomenon in the universe that you would be hard-pressed to explain. So, I definitely would recommend that you, you check out his book series if you're interested more into this. And then also, you know, if you are interested in really understanding more about the universe and, you know, thinking in a different way, programming, like learn to become a software developer. Even if you're not gonna necessarily become a developer and make that your career, it's pretty useful to know this stuff because it sort of helps you to navigate the world, especially if this universe is a simulation, which like I said, I do think that it is, okay? But you know, there's, there's so many things that uh, if you understand logic and you understand you know, some of these principles of software development that, uh, that start to make a lot more sense in the world. So anyway, that's, I think that's about it for this video. I'm trying to park at the same time as talking. So you can tell that my mind is a bit distracted, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, I'll see you tomorrow.